just wondering if... Hi, everyone. We're going to get started right on time. Uh, I'm Nathan, there by the way. Thank, thank you, you for having me. I'm one of the conference organizers. And uh, just real quick, I wanted to just give a welcome to the conference before I hand it off to the panel. Uh, so just a couple of things. Your button uh, is your proof of registration for the entire weekend. So hang on to it. You don't need to wear it to show it to security and stuff like yeah, that. Uh, do check the website. It has a lot of information, including the uh, harassment statement. Make sure you read. Uh, read that and agree with that. Not be here. Uh, <laughs> if, if, if something is going on, uh, it's uh, and, if, and if something is going on, the committee members all have this pin that says committee. Uh, you can also find people, museum staff, and security. Uh, so bathrooms. I don't know if you saw them, but right as you pass the registration table, there are bathrooms, as well as kind of tucked behind room C around the corner. Um, yeah, that, that's please respect the museum rules. This is a museum, so unfortunately, uh, like in this room, we can't have uh, coffee and stuff like that. And if you you have access to the entire museum, there's exhibits yeah. upstairs, just you can't bring a backpack uh, upstairs. Uh, there's a party tonight after the keynotes. There's an after party, there'll be pizza and beer at no additional cost, so you should come to that. Uh, the Wi Fi is listed early in the program, but it's the Momi Museum uh, events uh, uh, network, but it's, the information for that is in the program. And bandwidth is very, very limited. We will probably crash the Wi Fi a bunch of times and it'll be annoying, and uh, so don't like stream YouTube if you can avoid it. Uh, the hashtags, there's a session hashtag. Uh, each session has a unique hashtag. This is room A, this is session one, the hashtag is A1, uh, and so forth. Uh, we're very kind of serious and annoying about time at this conference. We start things right on time. We ask uh, that moderators make sure to keep the panelists on time and to end the panel right on time. I know it sometimes it seems nice to go over, but those 15 minute breaks can be uh, important for uh, discussions and things like that. So that's all I have. Just And again, thanks to the museum. Please treat the spaces. Uh, with respect, they certainly treated the, con the conference itself with respect, so we'll show them uh, that as well. So sorry for taking up your time, I'll hand it off to the panel. Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much, Nathan, for having me here for business. Uh, I was also informed that people should probably try to move towards the center to make uh, the outer seats more welcome to anyone who is in late. Uh, so, with all the housekeeping business now well and truly out of the way, I would like to welcome you to this first panel of the Horizon of the Web, Transitioning Identity. I won't take up too much of your time, my job really is to sort of fade into the background like that Homer in the Hedge gif for the better part of this panel. And I'll simply introduce myself by saying I'm Catherine Cross. I am a PhD student in sociology at the City University of New York, the Graduate Center, and my research centers on antisocial behavior on the internet. But that's not why you're here. You're here for these wonderful people. And I should introduce these fantastic researchers who are doing all sorts of exciting work relating to the panel's theme, covering a wide range of topics reflecting trans identity online via poetry, selfies, activist websites, and hacker collectives. Through them, we shall take a tour of the ways in which oh, the online world is mediating a form of counter-recognition for communities not normally acknowledged in discourse on researching the internet. And so, our researchers today Corey is a trans researcher in the final year as an undergraduate at Cambridge University in the UK doing sociology and anthropology, he or they pronouns. Brian Callahan is a second year student at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. His research focuses on how different online communities select and enact digital collaborative forms. Rachel Stonecipher's work Meanwhile, tracks historical shifts in the symbolism of woman identification in LGBTQ discourses, focusing on the productive relationships among feminist perspectives of desire and agency. She is a PhD student at the Annenberg School of Communication at the University of Pennsylvania. And last, but certainly not least, Junia Dare is a poet, friend, and facet of a larger whole. Strictly all ages, no Nazis, find more by throwing at Prism XP a follow on Twitter. So please welcome our august panel. I'm 
So uh, I shall now let them take centre stage as a brief reminder, 12 minutes for each person. I will have placards letting you know when you're about to go over time. Uh, yeah, I think the placard will be important, uh, but I, I practiced a few times, so hopefully we shouldn't come to a fire every time. Uh, while I pull up my, I just learned, is this like a cool academic thing, calling it a deck? Uh, <laughs> I was stressing with my friends at, uh, last night because I genuinely, like, was only viewing that word in terms of, like, Yu-Gi-Oh cards. <laughs> and so, like, got to New York and was like, oh my god, I don't have a deck. <laughs> like, what do I bring? And they were like, it's a PowerPoint chip. She's like, a PowerPoint. Um, but so, this is my PowerPoint. I can figure out how to, uh, Uh, is it? <laughs> oh, play. There's a big play button. Wow. Super easy. Um, wonderful. Uh, so I will start uh, with a brief shout out and then an introduction. Um, I'm really glad all of the people that the room here came to this panel. I think the panel's going to be really, really wonderful. And I wanted to acknowledge uh, the group at Lightwork Gallery in Syracuse, which is also watching. And then um, I guess now, because he just defended his thesis, Dr. Kane's uh, poetics class at the University of Mississippi, who is also watching. Uh, I'm sorry for the students that your professor made you do something. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is my talk entitled Accumulating Names, the Poetry of Prismatic Identities, Hot Process, Not Hot Mess. The subtitle, is, uh, as we'll get to, is taken from a tweet of an artist that we'll discuss briefly named uh, Sean Henry Smith. This is one of his pieces in his last showing. Um, it's a photo of a uh, genderqueer student um, named Ken Lopez uh, exploring sort of the nature around him. And I think a lot of what we'll be dealing with is with constructed natures and constructing yourself sort of against natures that are given to you. Um, I wanted to start, however, with a confession. Um, I think as long as I can remember, I wanted to be a mononym. I made little Lego things with my uh, with a camera that I had when I was a kid and would always just call it Chip, which is what my family called me, but I don't think I have the pipes in the bank account to become the next Beyonce or Stendhal or Trotsky or any of these very important political figures. So it became incumbent on me to not just want to be known as one name. And from there, I realized that I was going to have to be known by many names if I wanted to show everything that I wanted to show to the world. So I'm Junior Dare, which is the name that I use for poetry, for critical technology, for a lot of direct action work that I do. I'm also Chip Sinton, which some people in the audience know me by, which I use for comedy, electoral politics, uh, virtual reality stuff, and like physical augmentation of reality, because I can't call myself an artist. Um, my name is also Cameron O'Hara, if you ever see that name uh, in, when you're reading sci-fi short stories, I render into that. Uh, and William Cameron said the second uh, for the things that get me money for jobs. Uh, also, give me a job if you have a job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for the purpose of this audience, I'm going to be Junior Dan. I'm going to be focusing sort of on you and cheating out for a live stream a little bit. And I think that that's really crucial and important. Um, basically, uh, a whole part of my talk with prismatic identity is going to be about how it's vital to be focusing on the people that you're talking to, and that's always been an incredible human thing. And that uh, co as corporations, uh, specific, specifically technology corporations, have much more influence in our lives, they're going to want us to talk to everyone at once. And sometimes that can be a cacophony of just your own voice that will be definite and will really reduce what you can create and what you can give out to the world. Uh, going through my title, because I hate when titles just make, remain mysterious, Accumulating Names comes from this review of XTX, which is a wonderful sort of alternative literature writer uh, championed by Roxanne Gay, and this is a review by Melissa Moore, who I loved because she, uh, in her review, gave names of screen names she was otherwise known by, Fever Theory, other usernames. I think everyone at a conference about the web has lived in a content-rich web environment where you have other names that were important to you, whether it was just your AOL screen name or uh, your original MySpace. Uh, these things, we're told are not important, but seem vitally important to me. 
Prismatic identity is a concept I've worked with a lot uh, since 2011 and 2012, and it's taken from uh, Chris Poole, the guy from 4chan, <laughs> um, a talk he gave at the Web 2.0 Summit. And basically, prismatic identity, this is where the facet of a larger whole comes from, says that rather than viewing ourselves as a very flat identity, and we are being flattened by a lot of forces around us, we ought to realize that we are much like prisms, that we have many facets and we have a lot to show. We talk to our family, we talk to our friends, we talk to our bosses, our coworkers, our collaborators in different ways. And this sort of code switching is a code on which a lot of the vitality of human interaction is built. It's a fuzzy code sometimes, but it's much better than a streamlined idea that your one identity is who you need to be for for everyone. Because that's something that people are pushing on us for profit. The hot process, not hot mess. Uh, I work a lot with Deleuze, Rancier, and Spinoza a lot. Uh, I also work a lot with Sean. Uh, so this is the tweet that it came from. Um, and I think that it sounds kind of corny and it can make academics roll their eyes, but uh, thinking of ourselves as becoming and thinking of ourselves as processual is going to be increasingly important in the 21st century. And that these are lived practices. These are not things that are just for our papers, they're things that we should bring into the spaces of people who don't have the privilege of maybe sitting in a seminar and dissecting these ideas, because a lot of people can be really, really constrained by received ideas of fixed being or single name identity, that who you are is who you are always going to have to be, instead of there's always the possibility of building yourself into what you're comfortable with, into what can let you thrive and survive. Um, the point of this talk, uh, that's the movie The Point, which everyone should, well, should watch, uh, is how uh, we can find these emancipatory possibilities against uh, single name, single subject identity, instead allowing for variable name, single subject identity. And that's going to require resistance to corporations. Uh, and I think that that is a positive resistance with which we can find, with which we can find meaning. A little bit of background, how did we get here? Uh, James C. Scott has a very classic book called Seeing Like a State. I would recommend that, although I understand that as you get deeper into academia, Maybe that book is sort of basic. I've seen uh, sort of debates about James C. Scott versus David Cabrera versus other people. I sort of, for people who aren't in the know, I would say James C. Scott is sort of like the Katy Perry of anarchist anthropology. <laughs> David Cabrera is sort of Lady Gaga, but I've heard amazing de defenses of Teenage Dream, and I think that you should really give this a shot. Naming practices, and there are naming practices in non-Western states, which I just don't have the time to get into, which are equally interesting for how states and empires build up identifications, but come from these urge for management, for index, and for the ordering of the raw human power that you get if you're told that you control a lot of people and control a lot of land. Uh, but basically, that doesn't mean anything unless you can count them, you can list them, and you can refer to them. So my given name, Sinton, uh, just was a peasant's name who had to go for some sort of registration, and they said, what's your name? He gave her his name, and then they said, where are you from? And he said, Sinton, south of town, and that's why I'm, I'm just chip south of town. I have no idea what town it is. Uh, immigration flows led me here centuries later, but that is sort of where we get this idea of our very sacred names, is most of the names in here are sort of random and were given for the purposes of documentation.
feel about pictures that other people have taken of you. Um, a few people mentioned that photos by other people seem in a way more objective. They capture the bad things about they really, like how they really feel. But also, if they look good, it, it makes them feel better than selfie would. Others are overwhelmingly not keen. No three pictures. <laughs> no code. Um, now, this was written about young cisgender women's selfies, but we can see the same thing happening for trans people. Before now, the dominant images of trans people online were famous people and pornography, and all of, all, almost all of that was trans women and just incredibly dehumanizing and unpleasant. But now we've got this sort of proliferation online of trans people in all states of dress, um, according to their own choice, and people of all races, sizes, identi identities, Although the word colonization that is used here is maybe a little bit telling, because you can see the white trans men tend to dominate the visual sphere and get more attention and praise for their selfies, with arguably the least social risk to them for the publicity. Whereas trans women suffer from hypervisibility, essentially, they've got so much scrutiny placed upon them that um, selfie days are arguably less useful and could, could be harmful, some people would argue. <laughs> Um, people have also said that um, they can feel like pressure from seeing other trans people online to look a certain way. Um, it's usually they said from seeing people of their own gender, um, ones who are further along in their transition or who they feel more attractive. And trans women especially have this pressure to conform to sort of ideals of femininity. Um, but not fitting into conventional standards is rad, rad as hell. Um, and we can see here, this is a quote from Rachel Simmons, who wrote an article for Slate um, defending selfies as tiny bursts of girl pride and a way of self-promoting that girls aren't given much space for. And I think that's the thing that we can see happening here with trans people. Um, Self-esteem can be really powerful politically, and so this community of positivity that's created online um, is just a massive thing, and it's also a big group of trans people connected to each other who can then mobilise when political action needs to be taken. Selfie movements we've seen lately are relatively easy to get trending for political purposes. So we saw with the bathroom bills, people taking pictures of themselves inside um, the wrong gender bathrooms um, to protest being forced in there by law. And um, people have said um, it shows that we will be seen and heard and not go away if we're ignored. Now, people have said about the selfies of cis teenage girls that they're individually banal, but en masse revolutionary. And I think actually the difference with trans selfies is that they are individually revolutionary. They're politically important in terms of making trans people visible and pushing for justice. But the most important thing that they do is foster this really tangible sense of community and validation and appreciation for trans lives. And we've seen what a big issue self-esteem is for trans people. And I think that selfies, whether you're showing them to a community, to friends, or you're just keeping them private, can be a massive part creating self-worth. And I'd like to finish on this quote from one of my respondents saying, a selfie for a cis person is usually a confidence booster, but a selfie for a trans person is a defiant act of self-love and a re record of an incredible journey. Thank you. I don't think I could get away without doing this. Can I just take <laughs> <laughs> Uh, of all that, I left my USB stick with my PowerPoint in that car in Hawaii shop. But I do have a paper with me, so I can uh, read the paper. This is a pretty cool print. <laughs> <laughs> you can just imagine like your favorite PowerPoint playing. Kind of balanced out. So, Three hundred million dollars. 150 million dollars, 50 million dollars. 
These astronomical numbers sound like the latest round of venture capital funding. But it's actually the amount of money Google, Facebook, and Apple have all pledged towards tech diversity initiatives. And what exactly do we have to show for all this money? Well, it depends on how we analyze it. On one hand, anything promoting women and minority groups in tech are moves in the right direction. On the other hand, as one recent article on Model View Culture argues, these top-down programs from large multinationals and conferences have not paid attention to the axis of race with the same care and focus as they have gender. Money can help, but it renders the problem something that might simply be fixed. If only enough money can be thrown at it, and those marginalized people in tech simply become passive recipients of this great generosity and have little to no agency to determine what diversity ought to look like. Even more unfortunately, with equal payday being this past week, some tech companies like Microsoft have taken to saying publicly that they have no gender pay gap, which in order to do so required some twisting of pay numbers and some interesting mathematical gymnastics. <laughs> So instead of these top-down initiatives from the richest companies in the world, what happens when we try to enact diversity initiatives from the bottom up? That is to say, founded by those marginalized, run by them, and run for them. How do they think about diversity among their ranks? How do they create spaces for themselves? And how do they understand how they contribute meaningfully to increasing diversity in the tech sector? And what have they learned about themselves, and what lessons can we take from their experiences back to those top-down so I'm going to spend my time today discussing a collective of transgender women, computer programmers, and hackers that I've been engaged with in research. The last six months or so, the collective has become a site for trans women to think about how they can bring themselves, individually and collectively, to work towards that more diverse tech sector in ways that they know how, based on their lived experiences. Of course, I don't want to make the claim that their experience are somehow the trans experience, because it's not. But it is their experience. And I do think that their stories are useful to share. For one, just drawing attention to these bottom collectives is beneficial in and of themselves. And secondly, I want to bring attention to the fact that the incredible bankrolls that these tech companies are showing out, to say nothing about the $4 billion that the Obama administration just earmarked for these same issues, don't somehow magically guarantee anything other than a continuation of the status quo. While the code, the computer programs that the collective created, are really cool by themselves, and I did have a slide I wish. Ah, a few people can ask about them, I can talk about them later during the Q&A. Um, my interest for this talk is to discuss the barriers encountered by the collective in order to achieve their goals of becoming an inclusionary but particularly defined space, which I call belonging, and increasing diversity in tech as they know how, which I call the belonging, as in belonging for a more diverse tech community. This plan has been negotiated on several stages, notably gender, class, and race. The first two appeared early in the collective's history, and the race stage arrived much later. And I'll talk a little bit about all of them. So the collective from the beginning was acutely aware of the intersection of class. Um, the founder, herself homeless for several years, has always focused on impoverished people as a core focus. And even before the collective focused specifically on trans women, they held an anti-poverty mission. So first and foremost, they're an anti-poverty. The next goal of the collective was to create a safe space. But, for whom? While the collective is now trans women exclusively, that was not destined to be the case. For a definition of space, safe space, I'm using the definition provided by Sophie Tupin in an article she wrote a few, years, a few years ago exploring feminist hacker spaces as safe spaces. And she defines safe spaces as spaces, quote, based on the assumption that shared common values, whether explicit through a community agreement, or implicit through the sharing of values, enable members of a group to flourish, empower themselves, and create community. While Tupin defines hackerspaces through Wikipedia's definition of the term hackerspace, which emphasizes a meat space physicality in time and place, it's like this could be a hackerspace, but only digital couldn't be, I want to suggest that digital spaces, such as their collective, do in fact meet all of the requirements to be a hackerspace, and are themselves perfectly valid hackerspaces. So despite there being some well-known feminist hackerspaces in the world, the majority of hackerspaces are still white male-run and white male-dominated spaces, with all the stereotypical white male tech culture that goes along with it, which can make non-white males feel unsafe or uncomfortable, or unwelcome. But for many of the trans women in this particular collective, the feminist hackerspaces they went to didn't provide the refuge that they were seeking. Instead, these feminist hackerspaces 
simply reproduce that feeling of unsafety and unwelcomeness. One early member of the collective, during a discussion about other women in tech groups that she could join, admitted while she didn't have a lot of experience with those other groups, said, quote, those organizations are accepting towards all women-identified individuals, but that doesn't mean a lot of trans women will go there and seek acceptance there, and thus be validated. I think having a more specialized organization or group of people is safer. Our organization is safer for trans women to go to because our focus is on trans women. It's interesting to see what other people's identity politics dictate what group they can join. And having the collective for trans women, more trans women will feel like they're allowed to join. The partner of another member, um, who her, themselves was non-binary, but often passed as a cis woman, explained it this way. There's more flexibility for me joining a women in tech group. A lot of organizations now serve women in tech in general, where, whether cis or trans, and an organization like that would accept me. They accept non-binary people. That may not be the case for trans women, or they're facing different challenges that make it difficult to join a women in tech group in general. The founder of this collective had another take on the issue. Her concern revolved around the fact that when she'd be a part of digital feminist spaces, she'd either directly experience transphobia, or she would notice that there were no trans women and sometimes no women of color, occupying leadership roles. As she put it, there was no one that looked like her in any positions of power. Like those who feel unsafe or unwelcome in white male-dominated hacker spaces, her experiences led her to feel the same way in these digital feminist spaces. Even so, the collective was not founded as a specifically trans women space, like I said earlier. Originally, all women identified and non-binary people were welcome. However, over time and with the makeup of the collective becoming more and more trans women, Eventually, the decision was made by the collective to be specifically for trans women. And it was not an easy decision to make either. Um, this was through heavy negotiation. In fact, several weeks of actively debating the pros and cons of what it would mean to be a trans-only space or a space that offered for all uh, female-identifying people. Their life experiences dictated that what they needed was a safe space for trans women specifically, and the people they'd be most effective at helping were other trans women. So while who could belong was negotiated, and ultimately not everyone could benefit, I think it very much greatly improved their ability to be longing. After, because after this decision was made, the collective was very easily able to ramp up their collective <coughs> activities to be able to financially and technically support trans women entering the tech sector. They can now offer emergency funds to trans women who need it. They've developed a curriculum that will help people who have no coding experience go from zero to their first tech job in about six months. And they have a whole group of mentors, most of which are trans women themselves, who have decades of experience in the tech sector as teachers for these up-and-coming new trans technologists. But the other axis along was race. So for a while, the collective was simply a bunch of white trans women. And it was interesting because they had a, I was stuck trying to reconcile their lack of racial diversity with a rhetoric of belonging, especially the rhetoric of there's no one here that looks like me. And so they created a space that looked like them, but looking like them as they learned kind of wasn't enough. And it didn't last for long. In the last month and a half or so, the collective realized that what had to be done if they wanted to be fully intersectional and they considered it successful was to begin advertising specifically for trans women of color. And several have joined and have become active members. And in the last week, the trans woman of color was actually elected to the board of directors. And the board is continuing to look forward to creating a new network that reflects their ideals. Said one member of the board, quote, better but still insufficient. If we stay here with one trans woman of color on the board, it will be tokenizing. We have to keep growing. We have to be specifically inclusive. And the work has paid off tangibly. A newer member who was a trans woman of color herself said, Quote, I knew about the collective for quite some time and steered clear of it, but when the founder reached out to trans women of color, I decided to check it out and liked what I found so far. So I don't want to suggest that the collective has somehow gone it wrong in the past, but I do want to suggest that answering for themselves who belongs in their collective has helped them figure out both how they can do belonging and belonging better. <coughs> that is, how they can immediately participate in the diversity in tech conversations. Their specific mission now is to aid impoverished trans women of all races in teaching them some marketable skills. In this case, it's the Python programming language and the basics of designing, implementing, and maintaining their own web server in order to get them that first tech sector job. 
They have a future goal in the works of creating a large pool of qualified, eager trans women, ready to normalize the existence of trans women in all tech companies, from large multinationals to small teams. Their goal, really, in the way they explain it, is normalcy. Trans people in tech, normalcy. So my goal in this short talk is to introduce some of the struggles that the collective has faced in creating belonging and belonging. Belonging in the sense of the inclusivity of all trans women in the space and how they got to that decision. But also belonging, the ability to articulate a particular vision of how they can be a part of the movement to see all marginalized groups in tech flourish. So I think if it's a struggle for this collective trying to create a digital space to empower themselves and participate in that diversity work, what are the top-down white male multinational attempts at creating a more diverse tech sector, even with those companies spending more money than the GDP of all countries? As I think the collective demonstrates, belonging and belonging are a negotiated pathway and a continually negotiated pathway. They couldn't do everything for everyone. But they can do some real things for some people. And for companies looking to sincerely increase the diversity of their workforce, they have to continue asking who's being left out of both their internal processes and the external groups for whom they're working and to whom they're spending all this money. As for the collective, they've recently gotten the attention of at least one of those multinationals. So hopefully, with their hard-won understandings of belonging and belonging, they will finally be able to make the differences they seek to make trans people of all races a normal, expected experience in the tech sector. that I heard on that show, How the Universe Works, last night. It seemed up for both of my presentations. <laughs> I'd like to start by giving a brief personal history, because the personal and intellectual are becoming more entwined for me. And if you can rescue me from that spiral, um, please step in. <laughs> <laughs> I'll raise some questions and some timid answers in a moment, which emerged first, I think, from my sense that the Academy is leaving the term lesbian behind. Uh, or perhaps it already was behind and it's staying there. I'm also raising these issues as someone still exploring my own gender identity or maybe in the early stages of that journey. As such, I run some risk of alighting the, com the complexity of perspectives of those who have thought longer and harder about their gender identities than I have about mine. Um, and please speak up in the Q&A or reach out to me if you feel I've done that. I'm just going to try to talk to my own experience. Okay, right quick, as we say at home, uh, I grew up in North Texas. And by the time I went to college at Southern Methodist University in Dallas, uh, I was so identified with being the object of feminism, with being told that I couldn't perform certain embodiments and activities because of being a woman, that identifying as anything other than woman didn't seem like an option. Um, in my neighborhood, female, hetero female heterosexuality was a given. If you were a lesbian, then according to popular wisdom, you were either a wannabe man or a man's rejection. Very long story short, it was a big step to recognize that the feelings I had for my female best friend in college as potentially, or it was a big step to recognize those feelings as potentially also intimate feelings. This intimacy was a paradigm shift. To call myself a lesbian was then not an act of coming out. In fact, I wondered at the time, could I have felt this on my own without that relationship? And I probably couldn't have. I know others' experiences are different, but that was mine. Um, in my case, calling myself a lesbian wasn't a coming out, but it wasn't irrelevant either. The term was a signal to the world that I was very serious about being with my then girlfriend. That there was a profound, very gay difference between that and other relationships I'd had that I was not going to change back anytime soon. I think I came to fully self-identify as a woman backwards through identifying first as a lesbian. The fact that my desired partner was female meant that we faced a special challenge socially to prove that we had chosen to be together in the world. This, I knew, was because I, like she, was a woman. There it was again, but this time more emphat emphatically. I must be a woman, because I am clearly, according to everyone else, now a lesbian. Lesbian was just the word for the agency in it. Lesbian, more precisely, was the aspiration, how I could live my life as I flipped the scripted years of lesbian erasing propaganda. Monique Vitek wrote that the lesbian is not a woman. I quote her. It would be incorrect to say that lesbians associate, make love, live with women, for woman has meaning only in heterosexual systems of thought, and heterosexual economic systems. Lesbians are not women. But if lesbians are not women, then who gets to call themselves lesbian? Who 
clearly, lesbians are not lesbians either. <laughs> so those are the feelings I've had, and here's the work I'm doing. I think the feelings preceded the work, but the work probably enabled their recognition. I've been trying to make sense of what woman identification means in an era where we wrestle with the conviction that genders are at least partially discursive constructions, if also deeply felt. And what does it mean in such a situation to ally one's sexuality with one's feminism? I've started studying autotrattle.com. Does anyone know it? Yeah? Does anyone write for it? <laughs> um, it calls itself the world's most popular lesbian website um, on its about page. And it's by many accounts deserving of that title, with 1.5 million unique page views each month. I chose Auto Straddle because among the few highly visible queer woman identified websites online, which there are a few, this is the place where conversations are happening about what the word lesbian means under the label lesbian website. Um, Auto Trial's branding portrays the site as fundamentally structured around lesbian relationships, or what it terms girl on girl culture. At the same time, many of its writers and readers identify personally as queer, a difference that has sparked much conversation on the site. In a recent feature posted by founder and editor in chief Ruiz, staff writers publicly stated how they identify with about half referring lesbian, half referring queer. And there are other identities there, but I'm just going to focus on those. I'll we can talk about them in the minute. The same rough statistic emerges from the Auto Trial Reader Survey from 2014. Um, asked to pick all the scripters that apply, about 45% of Autostraddle's readership who voted identified as queer, and about 53% as lesbian. Reese herself has written, I usually say I'm queer, but I also love the word lesbian, and I cling to it ever harder every time a fellow LGBTQ treats it like an offensive term that isn't nearly as evolved as more expansive identities. Feminism is a key part of the site's activities. Its about page describes it as, quote, a progressively feminist online community for a new generation of kick-ass lesbian, bisexual, and otherwise inclined ladies and their friends. Sounds like lesbian feminism again. Mm -hmm. uh, the site is trans-inclusive, stating this common policy that, quote, queer trans women belong in the queer women's community. This gendering signals the site's focus on trans and cis women's experience. Autotraddle's commitment to the liberation of women's desires causes it to tread carefully, though, around the issue of non-binary gender identification. As of today, its about page contains the statement, quote, Although Autostraddle is a website created for and primarily aimed at lesbian, bisexual, and queer women, cis, and trans, and always will be, as the community evolves, we're also starting to include work by and about non-binary identified folks in our community. So gender does matter in Autostraddle, not in spite of queer identity, but as part of it. My research question is, how does Autostraddle reinvigorate the specificity of lesbian feminism while invoking the inclusivity offered by the term queer women's community? The point here between uh, community and site is the reason for this talk. Site emerges as a metaphor here for space, for a homing space whose ambient lesbian appeal, that signifier, the L word, makes it a women's space by the power of a lesbian prioritization of relationships with women. The community who's attracted there, on the other hand, doesn't have to be made up of all lesbians, or even of all women. Uh, I chose the method of corpus linguistics to look at how users of the site talk about themselves, their relationships, and the imagined user community. Uh, here's the definition. Um, I created a corpus of the entire collection of advice column <coughs> articles and their comments, which include like some topics like how to be gay. Um, this is because I knew from my history as a reader that the advice columns were a, both a popular and an editor-recommended editor place for new users, as well as the site of a lot of these identity questions. Um, clusters are a particularly good way to get adjectives modifying nouns. Um, by analyzing clusters, I found that the terms lesbian and bisexual were used more often than queer as personal identity terms, for example, in the phrase I'm lesbian. On the other hand, queer dominated as a descriptor of the site's community. Queer community emerges fairly often. Um, I found no one identifying a single in the advice columns. Quite the contrary, the phrase my girlfriend emerged as a dominant player in first person narratives. <laughs> 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 um, I, so, so finding that, um, I thematically coded all of the appearances of my girlfriend, my partner, and my wife to see what that was about. Um, and I found that the gendered nature of the term my girlfriend came up over and over again in stories about coming out or being visible as queer. I'll read a few examples. And although the comments are public, please don't look these speakers up. I'm still working out how best to ethically quote, and I appreciate this. Um, here's one. Since my wife and I were together before I transitioned, no one seems to recognize that I'm a lesbian, or at least it hasn't been an issue. In a way, that actually bothers me more, though I suppose they'd have to accept that I'm female first. What's even more frustrating is that this is number two. What's even more frustrating is that when I'm in a long-term, very serious relationship with my girlfriend, and people question my sexuality along with her gender identity, and I end up fighting two battles. Yes, I'm a lesbian. Yes, she's a woman. Three. 
You can also just challenge people's assumptions, like when they say boyfriend, say, or girlfriend, or why do you assume my partner is male, etc. Or, I never came out to my mom, but my girlfriend and I live with her. We're in college, we share a room. And I know that she's 100% okay with me being gay, though we've never talked about it. Five, I always bring my girlfriend and everyone knows that we're together, but I've never said it to any of them. It's so awkward, I hate it. Six, my girlfriend and I are both gay. I may identify as a lesbian and she may identify as bisexual, but this does not change the fact that we both fit under the queer community umbrella. And there are like many more examples like this. Commenters aspired to make their relationship visible as lesbians. But also, quite often, that relationship was the condition for becoming visible as a queer woman. Autostraddle's focus on the experience of having a girlfriend functions like a counterpublic in the way Michael Porter has theorized the term. Counterpublic texts call people into relation with one another simply by attracting their attention. This is Warner's idea. You hear something and you identify with it, you turn your attention toward it, and suddenly you're in a relation with other people who did the same. Warner writes that the texts of a counterpublic address potential audiences as, quote, the strangers they were until they happened to be addressed by it. This is how the world gr girlfriend, I believe, hails people on autostraddle as caring for and about women. It is having a girlfriend, he quotes, and negotiating how to be visibly and thoughtfully with her in the world that hails users, however they identify as having lesbian feminist concerns. Scholars have yet to explore the apparent affinity between lesbian spaces online or lesbian sites um, and the queer and otherwise identified bodies that often inhabit them. In other words, to move beyond formulations of this diversity is necessarily dialectical and intention. The explicit lesbian feminism autotrital espouses, combined with its embrace of queer and trans identities, implicitly bridges a divide between queer theory and lesbian feminism that has been hashed and rehashed in feminist theory. As many have written, as others, lesbian feminism occupies an uncomfortable position between feminist and queer theories of power, often criticized for its seeming reliance on essentialist categories and separatist constructions. Ian Barnard argues that separatist communities may not necessarily arise from opposition to an outside other, but rather from, quote, foregrounding inside interaction as the primary focus of social relations. Hmm. I argue here for a discursive notion of separatism that does just that. Queerness, queerness, well, let me read it. <laughs> discursive separatism, uh, which I'm defining as the moment when the county public forms along one primary axis of identification with the chosen or elected orienting difference in relation to that identity rather than kind of in the mainstream world as it, as it exists and as it diffuses those things. Queerness, then, depicts the excesses around and in relation to the abject category lesbian, even while the L word lesbian remains a homing call. Um, within the academy, lesbian remains the markedly abject category of sexual identification, I think personally and academically. Um, Largely, I think, because it is the binary laden way in which queer and, and bisexual women come to be recognized in the social world as sexually non-normative. Um, it describes a relationship, I think. While queer describes sexually abject individuals and populations, there's a lot of good work on this, um, lesbian has long described an abject relationship category. So I guess my question is, how can we move toward queer and lesbian futures together? <laughs> Thank you very much to the panelists for those very enlightening presentations. Counter recognition unites today's presentations a prism of names that fork identity into ever growing fractals, selfies as a mirror for a new gendered vision of who we really are, seizing the means of image production. Hacking, hacking through modeling diversity from the ground up and creating space for we trans women who everywhere else deems to be taking up too much space. What can lesbianism mean in the 21st century? And how do we imbricate this with an identity as a woman? How do we recognize ourselves in this virtual age where what is real and solid has melted into digital air? All these questions and ideas and more were fluttering about in my head as I listened to these presentations. And it is on those notes that I imagine many others in the audience might have questions. So we have about 15 minutes for Q&A. I would make one very clear request, and it revolves around the eight worst words in the English language. This is not a question, it's more of a comment. <laughs> Please do 
not do that. <laughs> I have to find the question mark in your remarks with the magnifying glass. It is too long. <laughs> Be respectful of the time of the panelists, my time, and the time, most important of all, of your fellow audience members who may also have questions. So with that in mind, who wants to start us off? I think my question is kind of around uh, giving me sort of sense of like there being like a homing word or like a beacon and like kind of uh, gathering communities around like single variables, like being able to kind of like find ourselves and fight more, like how that intersects with the idea of like identities kind of spilling out into multiple directions is really interesting to me because I'm, I'm wondering like how you guys feel about identifying as multiple things at once and like for me personally it's awful and terrible and I don't know what to do sometimes when I'm trying to find community and I find that instead I identify as other things that the community is not so like how do we kind of negotiate for ourselves the feeling of identifying as multiple things, even within some space that is ostensibly queer and has like the embrace of multiplicity and non binariness like as a part of its core. happens when we feel those differences within a space that we have elected to be a part of along one dimension is that we, this slides dangerously into tokenism sometimes, but we have this opportunity to articulate that difference to people who already care about some dimension of ourself. Like there, I just feel like commu community is there and so there's listening party and maybe dialogue is more possible. I know dialogue is like this kind of uncool way of talking about communication, but there's, I think, Recognizing that we're dealing with this paradox is more productive than abandoning the paradox. We're not like trying to connect to people. I think also the one of the things that seems to keep coming up when the same political movement starts, people will find all the things that it hasn't addressed and you know, say like with the community that's geared around trans women, people will start saying, Oh, that's really not inclusive of you. But I think what we have to do is make sure that if you are focusing on a single identity, you include all the members of that identity, so you include races and classes, and um, make sure that there's one for, yeah, like I said, that kind of multiplicity. Um, and when, yeah, when you are organizing across one single line, make sure that you're doing it right. <coughs> um, and then, sort of building off of that, uh, I think it was interesting a couple of us uh, all sort of talk, touch on these like Warnerian like counter publics and publics and then below that you have this level of community which is a word that comes around a lot and uh, a word that I think is one level below that but in, because of that I think can become more vital or is what I experience is more vital is friendships and so friendship becomes this really fraught and incredibly empowering political thing where uh, you'll find your communities but find your community so that within there you as an individual your many subjectivities that within who you are can find connection in that other person and I think that is what can sometimes ground these other fears is that like you always you always be at risk of being judged by the community so you need to work on your articulation you need to make sure that what you're doing is the right thing and if you don't have the safety of the connection of one to another or the becoming with of having someone that you can grow with and explore with, which sometimes can be the intimacy of a girlfriend, of a boyfriend, of a, of a friend friend, whatever, a non-gendered love friend. Uh, <laughs> that can be really amazing, and that's what is so tragic about alienation sometimes, is that people get pushed away from looking for that and in towards just looking for the larger communities that they can connect to, but communities are often like institutions they can't love you back like a real person can. And you'll find yourself a lot in those situations where it's the love that you receive back that ends up helping you grow and find yourself. I think one of the really interesting things about our translated functions is a surgical archive of things that people have said, so you can actually like 
and it links to itself all the time. So if there's a question about being a queer person of color here, you can link to other conversations about that, like identity happening in other places. So I think it's interesting a process of like expansion always. Mm -hmm. Also good on you, Jimmy, for using the word access. It's one of my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> so for Brian, uh, I know it's so common for, especially you know, I know a lot about like publications that are trying to diversify their writing staff, and oftentimes they'll put out a call for, say, non-white or non-cis participants, and so often it's very tasteless and poorly done because you're dealing with an already privileged population. Obviously, they want to diversify for a reason. And they just don't know how to do it right. So I'm curious how the collective that you are talking about, if you know anything about the kind of call that they put out for, um, like, trans women of color. Well, thank you, Brittany. Uh, so mostly they reach out on Twitter. So the founder and some of the main board directors are very, very active on Twitter. And they say things like, we have space, we have time, we have money. We have a community for trans women of color, and they they have they were previously upfront about the fact that they hadn't had it. That community. Now that they have it, they feel that they can talk a little more honestly about the fact that this is a community that is growing. <coughs> but for them, they're very big on on that like grassroots, do it on Twitter. They don't make public calls like on their website, for instance. They try to do it all within social networking, and they try to do it without. With like big official networks, so like they won't go to like the big multinational that they have and say, "Hey, can you help us find the trans women?" They, they're very proud of being able to do that themselves. Those are our networks. Just to follow up, do you know if there was any more like personal types of outreach, like for example, DMing people on Twitter, like seeing somebody who you know is could maybe be like a great fit for this community, and just saying, "Hey, just so you know, we're that does, thing over here." Yeah, that that happens. It happens uh, less. So if I was to like chart a graph of it, it tends to happen more when one of the trans women goes out and actually to talk about the collective. Because then other people in the audience say, oh, I have this trans friend who's just been looking for a space to be trans online. And then they'll point them in the direction of the collective. Next question. I'm sorry, I didn't catch everybody's name, but I think you mentioned something about being in a community correctly. And something I've been thinking about a lot lately is whether communities should define, I guess, the parameters, or whether it originates from the individual. And ugh, I'm sorry, I'm not a public speaker. <laughs> um, I guess I've been thinking about the question, like, how do you identify? And if that were, like, the basis of people's interaction, it allowed you to be in uh, group settings <coughs> without having to worry about being correct. So much. I think that's something that I've been thinking about a lot because it comes up so much in the queer communities that I'm in. You know, people will suddenly have been sort of kicked out of the community for saying something that wasn't exactly right on. It's stuff that, I mean, it happens again and again in communities through the years. Like, we can see it in like, stuff about the AIDS crisis, about the back and that, you know, who is saying the right stuff. I mean, it, it gets really tricky, especially because, you know, people who are your friends and loved ones are sort of treated as disposable because, you know, they haven't said the right thing. And people have rightly been pointing out that, you know, being really politically educated and having the right terminology, that's a lot of effort, that's a lot of work for people to put in. Um, and I think having things along identity lines it is really tricky because you don't want to say to someone, you know, for instance, um, older trans women um, use the term transsexual a lot, whereas people who are a lot younger would consider that an offensive term. And so they'll be saying, you know, oh, we can't have these trans women because they're saying stuff that offends them. And it's, it's an interesting thing, and it's so contested. And I think a lot of the time you have to sort of work it out with the communities sort of on a case by case thing, but I think generally the most productive thing that we can do is to say, you know, unless someone is is really being malicious, we should 
have a bit more sort of understanding for each other and try to foster something where we're all sort of on the same page in terms of just trying to get better and be more kind to each other. Um, I also <laughs> think a lot about this and I, I really appreciate you including that in your question. Just saying like I think a lot about this because I think it also foregrounds that for us, even though we're on this like elevated small stage and for everyone here, this is something that is just an active process of thinking. Thinking is really generative and thinking is for many people I think an interesting definition of life. Um, I also because I guess like the hot question of twenty sixteen for me has been like people taking me aside and being like, So are you trans? Like waiting for the identification, waiting for the word. And for me, I just I spend all this time, like literally all the time, like it's like a holy text with uh, Fricadio's Testo Junkie. And in the second to last chapter, Fricadio has, I'm saying totally, uh, I just do it with myself, has this wonderful bit about uh, their processing of just being alive in reality and how in the 90s in Barcelona they were like hardcore lesbian feminists because that was the only words available, but they have this bit about the limits of discursive and referential words. And I think a lot about identity in that regard in that they introduced this term gender dissident, which is what I end up finding myself drawn to because I don't know yet what words make me feel comfortable. I just know what words my friends need and I'll always support them and I never want to step on their toes. Like I just want to be there in the sense of, of the, per the person to person. And I think that can relate to the sort of idea of community uh, because I'm just a very dorky or nerdy person. I like to read old philosophers just to find what can resonate with my real life. And David Hume sort of drawing on Spinoza has this wonderful thing about how human institutions and communities are oppressive when they limit the human imagination and that you need to flip that in this concept of sympathy, which I think is this incredible political thing that I hope that we can resurrect is that at all times, human imagination should be what limits institutions and communities. And that if it's anything is getting in the way of what you're feeling or what your friend needs, then those words, that those rules are wrong, always, and just smash them. And that's fine. I think that's like a great way to organize. And Hannah Arendt, writing about this like crazy author who also uses a bunch of names, named Isaac Dinson, who's also like Lady Karen Blixen and a whole bunch of things, um, wrote that the most interesting storytellers, people who aren't interested in theory but interested in living, perform revelation without definition, uh, or that's my paraphrase that keeps coming back. And that's how I find comfort is that I just want to reveal, I want to make something being able to be seen or lived rather than be the person who has to sit down and formalize it afterward. And so to try to answer your question, I think the most important thing with these communities, and I like your idea of how do you identify, is that like you really sit and take the time with individuals and build always from that basis. You can create these spaces where, I don't know, Alec of Dark Matter was talking recently about, like, we are going to have to work against a history that has constantly erased the non-binary and what that means. Like, that right now what we think of as they and NB is going to be different in five or ten years. We just know that. And we know that in our lifetimes, if we're going to shatter gender, if we're going to proliferate strategies of resistance, if we're going to focus in, in Warner's definition from here the queer planet, that queer, or whatever the post-queer is, has to be thorough resistance to regimes of normalization, we're going to have to be thorough, and we're going to have to focus on making possible what right now is unspeakable, but is lived. And so those are those unworded places that I'm interested in, and I guess my answer would be find the communities that are built in the people that you care about so that if the community goes away, those people will be there. So that if someone tries to kick you out, you can leave with your squad. Sometimes squad is better than community. <laughs> <laughs> Um, if I can sort of draw on that, but also Rachel's stuff about sort of identity in the lesbian community, because I actually came to Quidditch through Water Straddle um, when, I, when I was a little baby gay, um, identifying sort of like, am I a lesbian? Do I like this girl? Um, I like, organized meetups in London, but then as I started exploring my gender, I was like, well, as like, a masculine person, maybe a man, it's not appropriate for me to be running these lesbian ish meetings. And so, and it was something I was, you know, sort of. It was my final year in, um, in school. I was torturing myself, like, you know, not studying with my exams. Just like, what's my gender? <laughs> I think at some point, yeah, you've got to just get on with your life. <laughs> like, it's so important to find your identity, and it does structure the sort of groups that you can or should and will benefit from being in. But also, at the same time, if it is causing you anguish, you've got to sort of just say, I'm going to put that to the side for now and, you know, get on with it. 
So it's a balance for us, right? But it's it's definitely something that, um, yeah, like you said, we're all very confused mutually. We're all just trying to work out what's going on. <laughs> And on that note, <laughs> I think it's rather apt for us to end the panel and thank our wonderful panelists for their research and for sharing their insights with us.